firms. This is good. This is good. Uh, Peter founded his own firm, Zion on Geopolitics, in 2012 to provide a select group of clients with direct custom analytical products. That is quite a description there. And Peter also, this is for me the most impressive, has authored four critically acclaimed books The Accidental Superpower in 2014, The Absent Superpower in 2016, Disunited Nations in 2019, and The End of the World is Just the Beginning in 2022. And if I understand correctly, there's an updated version of the accidental Excellent. superpower yeah. with a 10-year update. So we can kind of see where things went the way you thought it would. And maybe, are there any that go? There are. There are a few. Yeah. So it's worth the read. So I encourage you to do that. And if you're like, ah, oh, reading isn't for me, go to Spotify and type his name in. And you will find podcast, 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 if that is easier for you to consume. But if you give a nice round of applause here, I would appreciate our speaker, Peter Zion. Thank you. Okay, so originally we were going to start with some scripted questions, but I think you're all here to talk about basically whatever you want. And where are my international relations people in here? Come on, a few of you. Just a few of you. Oh boy. Okay, so that's where the foreign topics are going to come from. And I think that's where we should start. So what do we have on the table here? We have Russia, China, I heard North Korea. Come on, Abby. Where do we want to start here? There we go. So we, so there we go. So we have a veteran in the back there who wants to talk about Russia. So I'm curious to where this would go. What about Russia? So um, study um, European um, governments right now, um, like currently. So and I've noticed, or we also noticed, like Russia has had a, a terrorist attack in recent days. Um, well, according to Russia, they say that the U.S., the U.K. All Western powers. Yeah, they're lying. You already asked my question. You want to No, okay, so Russia's not a nation state. It's a multi ethnic empire. And the way it's always defended itself is by turning all of the nations that border it into cannon fodder. Uh, and so there aren't a lot of people in Russia who want to be there unless they're ethnically Russian. And even there, it's a little touch and go. So there are. 70 significant minorities, and most of those are Turkic of some flavor. The, the larger ones, the Tatars, the Bashkirs, the Chechens, the Dagestanis, and so on. Uh, so there's a really, really fertile ground for radical ideas uh, that are related to Islam in some way. And then if you go out from beyond the Russian Federation to the former Soviet Union, you're getting the Kazakhs and the Tajiks and the Az Az Azerbaijanis and all the rest. So uh, best guess at the moment judging from what's been going on in the chatter in the jihadi community, is it was uh, the Islamic State Khorasan, which is a splinter group of ISIS that just thinks ISIS are a bunch of pussies. Uh, and that they should just get down to the real deal of executing everyone who doesn't believe that the way that they do, starting with either non-Muslim governments that oppress Muslims or Shia. So their, their first two really big attacks, one was in Kabul as the American withdrawal was happening, they didn't attack us, they attacked the Taliban, because the Taliban, they also say, are a bunch of pussies. And then they went after the Iranians in January, and now they've gone after the Russians. So these are, these are not particularly nice people. Uh, and what st sets them apart from most other jihadi groups is they have no interest in holding territory at all. They're just all about the retribution. From the people that the Russians captured, tortured, and paraded on television, it looks like the people who did the attack were Tajik specifically. And there aren't a lot of Tajiks outside of Tajikistan. So it looks like uh, ISIS Khorasan is already operating with relative impunity within the former Soviet world. Now, for the Putin government, which has basically said, I'm the only way to keep you safe, they got a public, they got a private warning from the United States seven weeks ago that they we have been heard hearing chatter from isis corazon about doing an attack on a concert hall in moscow we shared that immediately and they ignored it so three weeks ago we said it publicly specifically warning any americans were in the area just don't go to a concert for now and then the russians poo-pooed it publicly saying that this was an american attempt to destabilize and we're a perfectly harmonious society and blah 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 and then the attack happened 
So uh, the propaganda machine had been going full tilt in the direction of there's not an attack and the Americans are idiots to all of a sudden, oh shit, this was all an American triple bypass play that was designed to do a, it's a ridiculous line of propaganda that is not getting any traction within the former Soviet world. And it's really showcased that Putin has basically put everything that the government is capable of doing from security issues into the war and left everything else naked. So this, this, is, this is bad. Because there are a lot of people living in the former Soviet world who really hate Moscow. Yeah. Sure. Anything else with Russia? We, let's get the Russia-Ukraine <laughs> nexus <laughs> questions out of the way. I guess now that you mentioned like sort of propaganda, um, the recent release of ours, the Tucker interview, there's more. Yeah. It was her. More, like, <laughs> An emergence of different perspectives on sort of how we view things and like now what do we know what is propaganda and what isn't is russia like yeah, depicted right. in that interview true or uh well i mean good propaganda always has a kernel of truth in it somewhere but that's usually where it ends in the case of tucker specifically he's been a russian shill for about eight years uh Can and you that? Uh, he has been accepting money from the russian government to push the russian position in western media for eight years uh, and after he got fired from Fox, keep in mind, Tucker has been fired from every journalist job he's ever had because he makes stuff up. Uh, and so when he got let go from Fox, it became apparent that even uh, was UAN wasn't going to hire him because he wasn't reliable. He went to Moscow because that was his only job opportunity left. And he did that interview, which was just weird. It's like Putin talking about how the princes of Numenor are the reason why this all started. I just, oh, okay. um, here's the issue. When we started the digital revolution back in the 1980s, everybody got a fax. And it used to be that every news outlet in the world had a series of foreign bureaus that had stringers, reporters, copy editors, editors. When the fax came along, they gutted all the copy editors because you just send messages back and forth. Then the fax gave way to email, and the email gave way to att attachments, and they got rid of all of the stringers and all the journalists. And they would just send journalists on reporting troops every once in a while. So if you remember back when, wow, you guys are way too young. When 9-11 happened, all Western media combined had one reporter on the ground in Afghanistan. And that one guy, Nathan something or other, became the face of America in Afghanistan when we were engaged in our first real war in decades. Uh, because that's all there was. Um, and then we got social media. And everyone could be a reporter, but nobody needed a record or fact check. So we now have algorithms and AI that are writing stories. So basically every foreign bureau of almost every media reporting agency in the world has been closed down with a handful of exceptions for places like that are just huge, like the New York Times. And they focus on finance. So all the chances we used to have in the publishing process, having eyes on a situation and brains looking at a situation, uh, for gathering the facts, for crafting them into a story, for fact checking on the back end, that's all gone. <laughs> and so in the United States, not just the United States, across the world, most media now is just some person in the home country with an opinion. And Tucker's operated very well in that environment. Uh, the only two institutions that are left that do it the old way. The first one is Al Jazeera out of the Persian Gulf. Uh, because they're like, we're not journalists. We don't know what we're doing. So what we're gonna do is if something happens, we're gonna send some people there to look around and tell you what we see. And if it doesn't make sense to us, we're gonna talk to different people and report what they see. And we used to call that journalism. Uh, and the second one is France 24, because it is an old state style funded issue that's not worried about profitability and you know, eyes and clicks. Now, they're not perfect. In both cases, ignore any reporting they do on their home region, because then all of a sudden that journalistic neutrality goes out the window. It's like, oh, there's zero. It's like, you know, we know what's going on in South America, so we're going to report. But if it happens in the Middle East, oh, we totally know what's happening in the Middle East. Let us tell you what's going down in the Middle East. And it, they're just no better than MSNBC or Fox. Uh, and the same thing for France from Europe. But those are, those, those are the only ones that are left. I guess it's just like it's hard to like so like 
interview like that comes out, and then perspective of Russian like that, we have no idea how. Like, what we receive as Russian like is obviously different from what you know, we have heard or learned. It's like, how do we discern the differences between? I would love to be able to give you a definitive source. Uh, the, the problem is something called the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which basically says that anyone who publishes anything, no matter where it comes from, no matter who's repeating it, you're not liable for accuracy. They did that so that the web services companies could get started and wouldn't get sued for being the communicators of the information, even if they had no say in its creation. But it's been carried to a point of view that uh, that accuracy is just not a value, and there's no legal requirement that anyone provides accuracy. Until that act is amended, uh, this is the situation we're in. Uh, I'd love to tell you that there's a place to go, but basically you have to develop a very, very, very good bullshit detector. Good starting point, anything that Tucker says is a lie. <laughs> Al Jazeera, France 24. Oh God, no, uh, it's certainly not gonna happen in this conference. Uh, that's some thorny work. Everybody agrees that it needs to be amended or repealed. No one agrees on what they want to replace it with because the conservatives are convinced they're being silenced, so are the liberals. It's a mess. In your opinion, how will it will continue until the day that the Russians lose the ability to fight. The soonest, let me rephrase that, from a manpower point of view, that's 2032. That's the point where they simply run out of men in their 20s to theoretically even throw into the fight. So that's the outside. Uh, it could happen sooner based on what happens to logistical systems. Uh, I don't think it's a sanctions issue. Excuse me, I don't think it's a sanctions issue. It's a question of whether or not the Russians are physically capable of bringing material and men to the front. So if, if, if the Ukrainians manage to take out, say, the Kerch Strait Bridge, then they can't resupply the Crimea at all, and all of a sudden half of the occupied territory turns into just a giant shield of exposure for the Russians. That could really change the map. Um, another possibility, what the Ukrainians are doing right now with using um, long and short-range drones to target Russian refineries is having a very real impact on the ability of the Russians to process crude. And the Russian pipeline system is not like the American system. If the crude can't get out, if it sits in the pipes, Russia's winters are no joke and they last until June. If they freeze, then the pipes stop working all the way back to the wellheads in Siberia. And if the wells freeze because there's nothing moving, you have to redrill those wells. So when you had that sort of backup in 1989 to 1992, it took the Russians 30 years to get back to their Cold War levels of oil production. That would destroy their income stream. Oil is the single largest line item for them for income. And without that income, the Chinese and North Koreans, for example, Iran, aren't going to be supplying them with equipment. That's a different sort of war. Doctor, I have a follow up question. Um, so, a lot of individuals having access to social media and stuff, like you mentioned before, and you mentioned drones too, I think you know, this trend, we see this in. in situation too. So with the drones, like you know, censoring targeting the technology, now that's in the hands of individuals and they can use this technology to decide you know, what to attack. And, what to and, and we, we've been seeing this in some specifically in this um, training war. How do you think this is going to you know, affect the future? So I've been really busy all day. I haven't been able to deal with my text messages, but let me read one to you. This is from Jesse Waters, Tucker's replacement at Fox. <laughs> what if terrorists use these new technologies inside the US? Just a few of them could take out critical targets and coordinate attack. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what we're seeing here is the democratization of high tech in military affairs. So the last time the world went through something like this, it was the American Revolution when the Americans started moving barrels worth of gunpowder into British ships and blowing them up. As that 
democratization of technology spread out, we got, among other things, the French Revolution. So yeah, this is a big fucking deal. Because now we've got people being able to go to Walmart or Best Buy and buying the drone hardware. And as we've seen with the Ukraine war, one pound of explosive delivered, delivered uh, cleverly is enough to take out a major tank. So yeah, you're looking right now at the next phase of not just warfare, but law enforcement. And so we're going to have to make some very uncomfortable decisions as a society. We may have pioneered this over the last 20 years in the war on terror with drone weaponry, but it's taken the Ukraine war to prove that all it takes is a motivated dude and a soldering gun. You say law enforcement is important. Do you mean like domestic yeah. law or you're talking about international? Yeah, I mean, think, think of what happens to crime or say the cartel wars in Mexico. If it's not... One of the things we've been doing with drones so far in the United States is, especially when it's going to be an assassination program, that goes right up to the president. And uh, that was because of Barack Obama. He wanted to personally sign off on everything. But he built no institution to carry that beyond him. So Trump comes in. Trump doesn't want to have day-to-day -day conversations about assassinations. He just wants them to happen. So he just kind of waved it off. And now it's done by a subcommittee at like the colonel level within the military that is not recorded. That was when one government, the United States, had near monopoly control of this technology. Now the cost of it has come down. It's not as robust. It doesn't have the range. It doesn't have the accuracy. It's not linked to satellite targeting for the most case. But anyone with a controller can put one of those little nanny cams. You guys are old enough to remember nanny cams, right? Remember when that was new? And for five bucks, you get a nanny cam. You like put it on somebody's door post so you could spy on them. Yeah, you put one of those on a drone with a small explosive. Anyone can do it. The next wave of crime is going to take that into account. The next wave of drug smuggling takes that into account. And so we're going to have to deal with this as a society because the only way to counter a technology is by using the technology. Now all of a sudden we're talking about law enforcement having, what's the word, warrant-free surveillance ability in order to prevent crime. Well, that has implications not just for public safety but for civil rights so we have a whole new series of domestic challenges to unpack and we're going to be doing it in the next five years the alternative is just the bad people use it and while the faa may think that's the solution because it leads to control the airspace whatever uh that's not going to work for the rest of us i don't have an answer for you my job is to show people the problems <laughs> So, so I'll ask a question. So if we're talking about drones and everything else, let's go to a different region. How about the Middle East? Why not? Nothing's going on there. Uh, how about the Houthis using uh, this kind of technology too? Again, it's kind of overlooked by a lot of things in the West. I wouldn't say that's what the Houthis are using. The Houthis oh, are using... I want you to discuss. Yeah, so the Houthis yeah. <laughs> are using much more sophisticated weapons that are being provided by a third party, Iran. Uh, the Houthis are arguably the most incompetent terrorists operating in the world today, uh, operating from what I would argue is the least valuable patch of land on the planet. Uh, and the Iranians are using them as a disposable asset, and it's going very, very well for them. Fun fact, though, you guys know who the best hackers in the world are? The American NSA. They maintain an offensive hacking capacity that is greater than all of the other governments on the planet combined. And they've started hacking the Houthis who don't have electricity. And so a lot of the targets that have been hit in the last four days have been Russian and Chinese commercial vessels. They just changed the digital transponders. And so there is a riot of fun conversations coming between the Russians, the Chinese, and the Houthis, and the Iranians right now. Oh, yeah. And what I've heard through the grapevine in the last 36 hours is that the Chinese have already had their first come to Confucius meeting with the Iranians about what the fuck is gonna be allowed and what is not in the Red Sea. And apparently, and then the Chinese have horrible encryption. So the NSA is listening on all of it. And apparently the conversations are just a hoot. Uh, we are not toolless in this fight. It just takes some time to adapt when something comes from a stream. Okay, who's next? John, yeah, go ahead. 
news article where Elon Musk allowed Ukraine to use Starlink, and it was working out well for them, but it's slowing down because of Russia. It's now bypassing the same thing. Devices that use Starlink. What would you recommend Ukraine do? Uh, the advantage of Starlink is it's a civilian network with hundreds of satellites, so there's always going to be a handle over the zones that the Ukrainians care about. Uh, and so, democratization of violence, anyone can use a Starlink system in order to get real-time data. Uh, the military system is much smaller. It's much more redundant deliberately. It's much more hardened, and it provides much more precise information because of those steps, there's a certain amount of time that it requires, even if both governments are really on the ball, in order to communicate targeted information. Whereas without artillery, the Ukrainians are discovering that they have to make decisions in seconds, not in hours. Uh, and so Starlink at the moment is critical to them. If they had artillery from their allies in volume, it would be a different situation, but that's not where we are right now. Uh, we're probably within 24 months of Starlink being nationalized because the strategic implications of it are so immense. Uh, I am not worried about Elon Musk. He will make out of this just fine. But he's made some very poor decisions at very inopportune times in the last couple of years when it comes to allowing or denying uh, I don't think he deserves half the bad crap that he gets for this topic. There are many other things that I think Elon's an absolute idiot for, not this one. Um, there's not a replacement system. There's not an echo of this system elsewhere in the world. Uh, the biggest thing that Elon Musk has ever done that was great uh, is the creation of SpaceX because it brought down the launch cost per pound by 95% which is what allows Starlink to exist. That's what I use at home as a Starlink corporate uh, product. As long as that is a monopoly, it's not going to be allowed to be in private hands because you can use it to target weapon systems. The question is, how do we get from there to there? And uh, barring an act of Congress, which isn't going to happen until January at soonest, it will be up to the American president. This side of the room is really polite and it's unnerving. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta quit doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone over there have a question? See, we're, we're democratizing all things, not just violence. Shoot. What do you think? Do you think the coalition of China do you think the coalition of China, Iran, and Russia and other countries outside with them, like BRICS, have any type of concern to the West and places like NATO? And if so, what do you think like, the timeline on that? Well, let, let's start with the very concept of BRICS. It wasn't created by any of the countries that are in the acronym. It was a Merrill Lynch financial product. Basically, you had some dude who's like, hey, you know what? There's a lot of mid-sized developing countries that have big bond markets. Let's, let's trade that as an index. That's where it started. Um, there aren't a lot of things that the BRICS agree on. The Chinese and the Russians have a territorial dispute. The Russians and the Iranians have a really bad history. Uh, Brazil's off in La La Land, and South Africa is dealing with some very deep domestic issues. Um, they're not interested in doing a joint currency. In fact, at the Johannesburg summit last November, the opening statement by the Chinese, the Indians, and the South Africans about was basically, we have no interest in a brick currency. Will people please stop asking us about it? Now, they don't carry with the financial papers here in the United States because it's all about, oh, do more the dollar. Uh, so there's that. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have some common concerns. But it also, until now, not 100% chance that this is still true, but until now, they've all been willing to sell the others under the bus if they can get a broader deal with the United States. That's certainly been the case for the Russians and the Chinese. What has changed? is that the demographic situation in China is now so terminal and the government has become so insulated from itself that they no longer have an accurate view of what's going on in the world. And that might make them, induce them to make a very, very poor decision in terms of backing the Russians versus other powers. What's changed is that the Russians are in what will be their last war. And if they lose in Ukraine, we're looking at national dissolution within 15, 20 years. 
that's changed is that India is realizing that they don't need any of the others and might actually be much better off without them. So the calculus for everyone that made the BRICS kind of a side deal all of a sudden does have some strategic implications, just probably not in the direction that most people are thinking. If it becomes a vehicle for miscalculation or self-sabotage, miscalculation on the Chinese, self-sabotage on the part of the Indians, that matters. It doesn't have to be part of the plan for it to be important. I want to speak to the is China. China. I'm from yeah. Japan, so that's kind of my... A little biased. Yeah, I'm just... Um, <laughs> I, 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 China, I think, you know, I feel like it, it has, you know, always been like about like a month ahead of, of war for like past maybe a few years at least. Um, and there's always this kind of a you know, threat in the right, right there. Um, and from the United States foreign policy point of view, Strategic ambiguity about Taiwan. Um, and in some sense, I feel like maybe it's been working out. That's why it's been almost like it's, it's close to war, but it just has never happened. Um, but as well as this, you know, I, I actually wrote a paper on this, and uh, you know, of course, there are pros and cons. And the cons are it, that basically encourages China to, once they decide to, to take over Taiwan, then they have to move very quickly. Um, then since it comes geographically, it's very close, and if they can once they circle it, that's going to be very, at least, easy to take and have it for um, So I want to hear an opinion on that. Sure. So I had this conversation at the Naval Postgraduate School, and I pissed off a lot of people, so we'll see how this goes. Okay. Um, China is the most trade-dependent country in the world. They import 80% of their energy, and 80% of that comes from a route from the Persian Gulf around South Asia, around Southeast Asia, and then up to the coast. They import 80% of the components that allow them to grow their own food, and they're the world's largest food importer. The country that guarantees freedom of the seas for commercial vessels is not China, it's the United States. The Chinese may have a fleet that in terms of number of ships is twice as large as ours, but most of those ships would fit in this room. Not all at once, don't be dumb, one at a time. <laughs> 90% of those ships have a range of less than 1,500 kilometers. So there is no even theoretical possibility that the Chinese can protect their own trade lanes. If there was a war in Taiwan, what would ultimately happen is that someone, Japan, Taiwan, us, Australia, Singapore, Vietnam, India, someone would put a handful of destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin cut the trade line, and within three months, the trains would stop running in China, and the food shortage would set in, and you would have a national collapse in under a year. Five years ago, Chairman Xi understood this, but in the last five years, he has purged everyone else within the Chinese system that is willing to speak with him, not tell him the truth, tell him anything. He has not surrounded himself with yes men. This is not Putin. This is not Trump. He has surrounded himself with silence. And so we have no idea what he's thinking because he's destroyed all avenues of information transfer. And we don't know. So he may, after five years of imbibing nothing but blind propaganda, he may think that maybe they can win a war in Taiwan. And maybe they can but that doesn't solve the trade exposure problem. So if China does this, it is the end of the People's Republic. Now, I would say we're gonna hit the end of the People's Republic within a decade anyway. The population's dying out. The newest data, which hasn't been confirmed, but there are a number of demographers in China who say it's accurate, is that they've overcounted their population by more than 300 million people, with all of the missing millions under age 40. So you're talking about a country that now has twice as many people in their 60s as they have teenagers. They're not long for this earth. The question is how they go out. And no one gets to decide that but them. If they decide to go out in a war that they can't possibly survive, that's a choice. I hope they don't do that. But I don't get a vote. So, so from like the biggest war possible, basically, 
nothing we can do just to see how things play out. And the United States has two choices. Number one, we can pick a specific fight designed to trigger complete systemic failure as a price. When you do that, nukes will probably fly, fly and we'll find out just how good our missile defense is. Or you can wait them out until they die. And that has been our strategy with the Russians since 1995. So this also has to do with China. It also is like economically, because you know how we had the supply chain crisis back in 2020. And so did today, but like since the automotive industry was hit hard, right, there have been a lot of really chips around for any kind of domestic or like product manufacturing like it was back in the like, 80s and stuff. What in terms of like policy can we do to like bring manufacturing back? As you know, there's like a 20 million dollar sure. billion dollar chip plant that's really getting built in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. 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 Okay, so why not? Let me, let me give you the good news first. Uh, the chips that are between 10 nanometer of quality and 90 nanometers, that's like 80% of global production by value and by number. I'm sorry, by value. And we're okay there. We produce those. Israel does. Ireland, Britain, Germany, Italy, Japan, Korea, China. It's a diverse network with a really redundant uh, supply chain system. You could peel an entire uh, continent out of international supply chains, and those chips would still be produced in volume. The, the issue that we've had, and it's a minor one, is that we have gotten so good at making chips as a species that we've started making very specific types of chips for specific products, down to the point that Toyota has different types of chips for their Prius versus their RAV4 versus the Corolla and others. And when we had our supply chain issues, that was the problem, that some of those subcomponents specialized chips couldn't be produced and so companies had to decide okay do we wait two years for the chip supply chain to catch up or do we start plugging the alternate chip into a car like put a Prius chip in a Corolla and they kind of went with a mix so I don't know if you guys have bought a Toyota or driven a Toyota that was put out in the last two years but you'll notice they all have this panel in the middle that doesn't look like it quite fits with the dashboard that's how they cut the corner they took chips from basically everywhere, took a handful of them, threw them into these panels, and artificially mounted it to the dash. And that's your modern car. Different companies came up with different solutions. It works. It's a little ugly, a little gum gangly. It makes servicing a bitch, but it works. The problem that we're experiencing is the sub-10 nanometer chips, because those don't have this redundant competitive ecosystem supporting them. There's one ecosystem. It has 9,000 companies. Half of those companies only make one product for one end user. And so if you break any little piece of it, we lose the whole thing. That's iPhones, that's satellite communications, that's electric vehicles, and that's artificial intelligence. So we're gonna lose that. We'll still have cars though. They might be a little fugly, but they'll work. <laughs> well, uh, just how do we get like more jobs and like we actually it's already happening we've had a tenfold increase in industrial construction spending in the united states in the last five years half of that is into electronics and computing i would love it if i would have loved for it to start it earlier and i would like an even sharper peak uh but we're moving in the right direction i know good news feels weird <laughs> Andy, go ahead. Uh, do you see any factors that could cause the U.S. to lose its uh, global dominance in the near future? To cause the U.S. to lose its global dominance? Uh, I'm watching the Ukraine war very closely for a number of reasons, not just because how the war go plays out determines whether or not nukes fly at us, which is a very real concern. The democratization of violence is something that plays against our strengths as a military power. The core of American power kind of falls into, in military power, falls into two categories. Number one are the aircraft carriers battle groups. Because here you can basically put 5,000 sailors and Marines into a cluster of ships, send them somewhere, and hit harder than any other country on the planet, save like four or five. And we have 12 of those. Perfect tool for knocking over a country. Second cluster is long-range reconnaissance and deployment. 
the ability to take a plane, a B-2, flying from St. Louis, bombing something on the other side of the planet, and then the pilots get home in time for the soccer game. Those two things are how we do what we do. Now, we have forgotten that because of the war on terror, and we got trapped in a two-decade period of military boots-on-the-ground occupation. Not our forte, and it showed. If this new evolution in military technology can somehow blunt, or God forbid, remove those two advantages, then we've got a problem. So let's say, for example, that we get in a shooting war with the Russians, and we send an aircraft carrier battle group up the coast of Norway to reinforce our NATO allies. If they get close enough to the coast that the Russians can send 7,000 Shahid drones against the carrier, they won't sink it, but they'll probably make it incapable of landing jets. And then all of a sudden, one of the pillars of American power has been basically destroyed or neutered for the cost of a bunch of mopeds. It's not cost effective to fight that way. The question is, how does the United States evolve in that sort of environment? And there is a program that has come out in the last four months that looks promising. I don't want to say it's going to be successful or not, but it's called the Replicator Initiative. And it's basically to take any flat top vessel we have. We've got 12 super carriers. We've got 10 what are called Marine Expeditionary Units. There's no Marines, right? Yeah. Marines, 3,000 Marines in one place ready to go. Yeah. And basically... <laughs> put a fabrication facility on each of the flat tops that can crank out roughly a thousand drones every 24 hours. And instead of having aircraft carriers sailing around, you get drone factories sailing around. And if you can do 500 or a thousand in a day, imagine what you can do in a month. The idea is to be able to hit with one ship, 20,000 targets up and down the Chinese coastline within 12 hours. That's a different map. I don't know which one of these is going to mature first. What I can tell you is that the aircraft... I don't see anyone's stripes. What I can tell you, open secret of the U.S. military, is if they open up both reactors on a supercarrier all the way, those supercarriers can sail at 90 knots. A Shahid drone can only go 100. That's a fun race. Can you just imagine, you just got, there's one ship who's left its escorts way behind. It's fast, the it's fastest ship in human history, and just this swarm of locusts following it. We're going to have some very unexpected military battles over the next 10 years as these technologies intermingle. Do you have another question? Yeah, so do you think that? U.S. would ever like to use a military battle with China? In no, the no, China's not going to exist 10 years from now, so I don't worry about that at all. Or like, because I know that China's good at like hiding a lot of their information. Yeah, you, you can't hide the sort of things that can take out a carrier. So if the Chinese Navy continues to expand at the rate it has for the last 20 years, which has been the fastest rate in its entire history, they will not reach parity with the United States, assuming the U.S. adds no ships. Until 2270. The gap is massive. The most that they can hope for is that if there is a fight, it happens within sight of the Chinese mainland so that the Chinese can bring their air force into play. And it would take a really, really stupid American admiral to let that happen. So, no, I don't worry about it. I'm not saying they're toothless. I'm saying I don't worry about that. I'll come to you. John, go ahead. Very, very, very short version. There are two things that depress your birth rate. The first one is industrialization, because when you live on the farm, kids are free labor. When you live in town, kids are an expense. And China has gone through the fastest urbanization process in human history. So their birth rate has collapsed. Second, when you shoot people who are having kids, also drops the birth rate. And for 40 years, they had the one-child policy. These two things happened at the same time. Today, with the best Chinese government statistics we have, the birth rate per woman is now 0.9. 2.1 is replacement level. In the tier one cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Fujian, and the rest, it's 
and China is far more than majority urbanized. So we are not just looking at an industrial and population collapse in China that will destroy the country this decade or within 10 years. We are now in a situation where the Han ethnicity will probably cease to exist by the end of this century. So there are many things about China I am concerned about. Their strength isn't among them. Iran's for forever. <laughs> yeah, when you start with the end of China, it usually goes that direction. Yeah, that's right. I think, well, I'm not pro, like, you know, the fact that there's a very thing, but one of the advantages of, I think, you know, having us, I mean, being autocracy, is I think, you know, I think there is a possibility that, you know, they can implement one China policy. So now it's going to reverse. It's too late. So, like, so I'll give you an idea here. So the, the American birth rate, which is right around two, We've now had a higher birth rate by Chinese statistics than the Chinese have since 1994. So this isn't a new thing. A normal pyramid starts with old people at the top, goes to children at the bottom, you've got more children, narrow, 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 narrow. The Chinese system is now like this. And if the newest data is correct, they no longer have enough people under age 50 to even theoretically repopulate. So unless you're talking Star Wars style cloning, where you grow people within three years and they just magically appear at age 18 with a full set of skills, they're done. I am unaware of anyone being close to that, just to be clear. <laughs> well, another thing I can say was, um, it's been, and it might be like the conspiracy theory, but, um, and I, I love questions that start with that. You, <laughs> man, come on, that's back to back. This, this thing called, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure in English term, but, you know, Black kids, that's how we call them. Basically, kids that, are, that have not been registered and recognized by the Chinese government. See, it's the opposite in China. There's certain points where you become, or the government becomes aware of your existence. So, for example, in the United States, uh, when you enter kindergarten, is one of those things. When your parents claim a tax deduction because of your birth, that doesn't count because they don't firmly see you. In China, one of the points was when you got immunized is when the government collected data. And what they've discovered in the last year is that the doctors were lying. They were taking the shots and instead of getting one per kid, they were spreading around four or five different kids and then reporting whatever they wanted and then selling the immunizations to third countries. So we haven't had good data on the Chinese birth rate now for 60 years. And with the revisions that have come out in just the last year, they're realizing that since 19, no, 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 since 2017, their birth rates dropped by 60%, just those five, six years now. I mean, that's faster than what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. So the question is how far up the population structure does it go? We now have government authorities saying that they've overcounted by 100 million. We have government affiliated statisticians who say it's closer to 300 million. So this, this has been very bad for a very long time, and now even the best case scenario tells us that it got maybe a decade left. Could be a lot worse. I don't want to say no, but I want, I want to see if there's other people that have questions because we're kind of getting up to time. So, please. Um, so you've mentioned a few times now, and sorry if you like already defined it or something, but um, do you think you could define the democratization of violence? Sure. So think of the difference between having a cannon and having a handgun. One of these requires a crew and probably a government to fund, and the other one with a few days work you can afford to operate yourself. We've had the same thing now happen to remote attacks. It used to be that, say, a predator drone is something the United States could man and control, but required a staff to build it, to maintain it, to operate it, and decide, therefore, the decision-making for it required a hierarchical, or hierarchical organization. But these new drones that we're seeing in Ukraine are basically garage projects. Uh, the very existence of the, um, the scythe, it's basically made out of plywood. And they've got a thousand Ukrainian dudes literally making these things in their garage. They slap a warhead to the front of it, and they send it off. Uh, that doesn't require a decision-making organization. Uh, they are still, to a degree, using a decision-making organization within the borders of Ukraine itself, but they're clearly sending special forces out into the field carrying something that's manned, portable, and 
Those guys are deciding on what their own targets are. And while these projects at the moment are still government machines, like the Phoenix Ghost, if you're familiar with that one, we're very close, like within months of them being able to do that on an individual basis. And once people can decide to use something that can strike at range with only a personal in, it, personal investment in terms of time, materials, operation, and targeting selection, that's a full democratization of the technology. And we're going to hit that at the latest next year. One more question. I saw your hand up. You're shying back behind there trying to hide. One more question. Can you narrow that down for me just a little bit? <laughs> oh. Yeah. I did okay. say this was the last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're settling. This could take a minute. Okay. Um, What's the question again? Basically, Israel, is there a way that this can be resolved in a way that's not horrific? Right? No. It's a short version. Uh, the Israelis are entirely within their right of making sure that Hamas is destroyed completely. Unfortunately, the only way that they can do that is to completely level the Gaza Strip. So already roughly one and a quarter percentage of the Gazan population has been killed. Best case scenario is that they will be done when they hit 2% death, which is already a civilian death toll that is just mind-boggling from my point of view. I see no reason for them to stop until they've done this. And I see no ability for them to do this in a way that doesn't result in mass civilian casualties. There's also the political question at home of Netanyahu uh, and the demographics of Israel. So there is a what used to be a splinter group in Israeli society of ortho, ultra-Orthodox who don't work, don't pay taxes, don't serve in the military, uh, and basically do what the rabbi tells them in political affairs. And because the government basically pays for them to exist, they've all had the large families. And that population has expanded till today, based on whose numbers you're using, they're between 20% and 35% of the population. They're very quickly becoming the deciding factor in Israeli politics. You guys know Matt Gates, right? The guy with the great hair from Florida? Okay, it's basically imagine if Matt Gates was Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, Secretary of Interior, in charge of Special Forces, and the Chief of Staff for the President. So someone with no military expertise, can't find Cuba on a map, but is convinced that throwing military force at everything is the solution. That's the situation Israel's in right now. And these people are the ultra-Orthodox. I think they have a God-given <laughs> approval to use military force however they want, but they have no idea how to use military force. So they use it very bluntly. That's piece two. Piece three, the United States has always had a hot and cold relationship with the Israelis for any number of reasons. But after what seems like three and a half eons of Netanyahu, we've seemed to be reaching the breaking point. You throw a tens of thousands of dead Palestinians on top of that, see the issue. We have made the decision as a country that the war on terror is over and that maybe it wasn't the greatest idea. We don't like the idea of mass deaths for a people who are basically living in an open air prison. We don't like Netanyahu personally, and we don't like his political bedfellows at all. Maybe we're done. All of it. The shale revolution means we don't care about the energy flows. And the only reason we cared about them during the Cold War is to keep the Allies operating. The biggest user of Persian Gulf energy now is China. The biggest user of the Red Sea is Russian crude that's evading sanctions. Our Navy is now patrolling this area so that the Chinese can buy crude from Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. How is this in our best interests? Say what you will about Joe Biden, and there's a lot of things we can say. One advantage of having a president that is older than dust <laughs> is he remembers how the dust got there. 
And there's a full reassessment going on in the White House right now of what America's position in the Middle East should be. What is it in the Middle East we care about? Because if it's not oil, and if it's not protecting China and Russia, what is it? I don't know how this conversation is going to come out. I'm saying it's the first time we've had this conversation, not just since the war of terror start, stopped or started, but since Israel was created in the 50s, 40s. If you can ignore the sunk cost of the pre-existing relationships, big if, the logical, purely logical conclusion is that the Persian Gulf is not worth our time. In fact, chaos there is bad for China. And the Red Sea is not worth our time because chaos there is bad for China and Russia. And the Levant isn't worth our time and chaos there is someone else's problem. Then maybe the only thing we need to do is have a partnership with Turkey <laughs> that has its own complications. But it's a lot less messy than what we're trying to navigate right now and has a lot clearer goal. That's what they're trying to figure out. And there's no end of emotional charged issues on all sides of this conversation. But again, advantage of having a president that makes Castro look like a toddler. It's, it's not that he can imagine a different world, he's seen a different world. And we might be seeing a new one very soon. Question, one question. What's the difference between the Madras and the ultra-Orthodox Jews? What's the difference between the two? They both just read books all the time and pray. I am not a Jewish theologian. I can guarantee you that it's, there's a very, very long and detailed answer to that question. I don't know it. I'm mostly concerned with the faction that does exactly what you're saying, however they label themselves. Uh, and they become a complicating factor in the relationship. Now, one possible outcome, of it, let's just say for the moment that I'm right here, and the United States really does pull back and just cuts a bilateral deal with Turkey to micromanage this region how they say fit, see fit. There are ongoing relationships with the United States. I'm sorry, there are ongoing relationships that the Israelis have with other powers. Uh, they've got a peace treaty with Egypt already. They've got a partnership with Jordan already. And the Abraham Accords have been signed with the Emiratis and the Moroccans. And right now, the Saudis are having a debate internally about whether or not they should continue their talks to join the Abraham Accords or whether they should try to hold out until this Palestinian thing is resolved. But the real telling thing from my point of view is when the Egyptian leadership had a conversation over Zoom at the beginning of the conflict about six weeks in with the Israeli leadership, and the Egyptians were like, is there a reason why you haven't killed them all already? Because we don't see it. And the Israelis are like, well, we want them to move, live, move to camps into Sinai. They're going, oh, no, 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 no. We controlled Gaza back in the 50s and the 60s. It was no fun for anyone. Absolutely not. Just kill them. And that's generally the view of most of the Arab states. The Saudis are not willing to say that out loud yet. But if we get to that point, then you can have an Arab-Israeli alliance with or without the United States. Everyone has some options here. None of them end well for the Palestinians. I hate to end on that very high note. Wee! But, <laughs> but I want to make sure that you have time to keep moving here. And if you're looking in the back corner there, there we have, is that the updated version there? Oh, we have multiple books that are going to be available there. So if you need need to get any book needs fulfilled, Josh is your guy right there. But can we have one more round of applause? Because I thought that was mighty impressive. Thank you. Thank you.